Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. This is Watches Tonight. This evening we chat live, we talk sub $3,000 luxury watches. Is that too low for luxury? You let me know. All that, I share your wrist shots and this will be a fully interactive experience. Sean is on the switcher this evening. We've already got Edward Ledden of Sweden in the chat box. I multitask during this show. True, I coordinate graphics with Sean. I stick to my topics, I interact with you guys, and I've got like five different car sales sites open as I'm browsing simultaneously. You can also open thewatchbox.com and keep me streaming. Here's the thing, we've got a new app. If you liked Watchville and you lament its demise, we have a media viewer where you can actually customize the journals and the blogs and the fan sites that you prefer. Get all of that, plus store your collection online, see my videos, and browse the latest from the Watchbox. We're on Apple, we're on Google, check it out, that's our app. Also check me out on Instagram, this is the official after party for Watches Tonight. I post 60 second reviews of the hottest watches we've got, we've got everything on there from classical to crazy, and that's pretty much how I roll, I put up the stuff that interests me the most, and often a lot of watches that are not listed on our website. So first dibs and only dibs in some cases. Tim underscore Maso on Instagram. All right, let's see who's in the box. Edward, I know you're there, but so is Arto Charles. We have Brady. We've got Mark S. from Brooklyn, Jim Millett, Dixon Lee, Enrique Cassiano, Keystar G60, Christopher H. We've got Stagecoach420, C. Flynn, Andrew, Jens, and Mufadal G, Bonafide J. Had to sell my Santos and OP39. I'm hurting, and this may help scratch my itch. You better believe it. The watches we've got in here are worth your while. They're not just affordable, they're genuinely cool. We got Todd, and we've got Biohazer with Brent Thomas and the Real to Fly from Beth Page, my old stomping grounds on Long Island. All right, guys, viewers, shots number one. We're starting out with Dixon L, who pegs the meter. That wins the night right off the bat with his Longa Saxonia Thin Copper Blue by the Duomo in Milan. It does not get any better, and he didn't even Photoshop that little shine on the dial. Max S. of North Carolina watches watches tonight with his Patek Philippe Aquanaut Travel Time. I appreciate that. We got Miroslav R. of Serbia, who shines with the latest Platinum Rolex Data. You know that because it has the fluted bezel and the ice blue dial. Simon stuns with his rare and exotic Longontina Frederick III. And Christopher H. watches the Dallas Stars in the playoffs, doubling up with a Saxonia thin copper blue. This one a little bit more colorful and close. I don't know. I, I still think that first Duomo shot takes it, but that's competitive. Guys, sh send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on my pixels. Perfect Liberty, Dave Opencar, we've got Miroslav in the box, and he's on your screen, Brick Lane, Ken Brown, and Jean-Claude Beaver. All right, guys, this is a lot of fun. My usual crew is here, and I appreciate that. Eric Nielsen joining in from Appalachia. So the best $3,000 watches, what counts as a luxury watch? Some people will say that $3,000 is too low for luxury. So we need to establish what we're talking about. Well, I've always said that haute horlogerie is handcrafted, whether it's ultra precise hand regulation, craft arts like marquetry or enamel, miniature painting, or extravagant finishing a la Romain Gautier, Philippe Dufour, that is haute horlogerie. It is the involvement of the human being that a machine cannot duplicate. Luxury is a bit more amorphous, at least as I see it, so I created two criteria that almost always work. First, there needs to be a permanent aftermarket for the watch. That is, there need to be people who are willing to own the watch secondary and tertiary, not just the first owner. So there needs to be a trade in pre-owned. The thing needs to have enduring value, in other words. Second, it needs to be serviceable. It needs to be repairable. Because obviously, people collect swatch and flick flack and various types of Casios that are not serviceable. They're collectible, there's a secondary market, but you can't repair it, make it new, make it work optimally again decades down the line. So I decided you put those two things together, that the watch must be serviceable and have a secondary market, and that's luxury. It's something that has a certain level of quality and permanence to it. It's more than you need, and hopefully more than you expect. Also, 
People ask, why would a high roller who can afford Jorn or Debetun or Grubel 4C care about these sub $3,000 watches? And I say, because you need a range of watches, horses for courses. Sometimes you want to wear a fine watch, not an exquisite watch, but a fine watch. You don't necessarily want to wear the Timex Iron Man or some sort of a Garmin. You still want to have mechanical, you still want to have Swiss, and you can with a sub $3,000 watch. You're not slumming it, so to speak. Other times, you're willing to risk only as much as you can afford to lose. Maybe you're going to an unfamiliar city or an unfamiliar town, but you still want to wear something of reasonable quality. Well, that's when you can put on that $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 mechanical watch and maybe not have the fear of God that it might get stolen or lost or broken. So that's why even if you've got the means, you might be interested in these watches. Value is always attractive, and sometimes we need to switch gears for something a little bit more modest, but again, not a disappointment. And on that note, here's a brand that's always done this well. In the modern era, Longines has slotted in behind Omega as Swatch Group's most important luxury brand. So the Longines Ultracron was new for 22, and this is one of the best values you're going to find in accessible dive watches. First, it's a modern high-beat diver stacked with features, even as it captures the spirit of 1968 with that lovely tonneau case and bracelet. So you've got a high-beat movement. Think Zenith El Primero, 5 hertz, 10 beats per second, 36,000 vibrations per hour. This is something Longines has done for decades, and they're bringing it back in a delectable package. It's anti-magnetic with a silicon hairspring, effectively amagnetic. Automatic winding with a long-ish 52-hour power reserve, and it's a time lab certified chronometer going beyond the limits of the COSC. This is actually more than COSC. Everything COSC is plus factors like durability, water resistance, uh, assembled timing, all sorts of important things that make this more than a COSC chronometer. It has a sapphire bezel that is fully loomed. You can see how the bezel seems to float above the base. Well, that's because it's sapphire and it's printed, a little bit like a budget Blanc Pan 50 Fathoms, which means the bezel is also fully loomed. It has a wonderful, lustrous, almost wet appearance that seems super premium. Plus, I don't know how well you can see this, but there's a sandpaper-like granular dial texture, and you can see that the dial is all applique indices, not printed like a vintage watch. This feels very, very premium. So you get a five-year warranty, which is good as Omega or Rolex. You're not slumming it there. And remember, in an era when Patek Philippe still offers only two years, five years on a watch like this seems quite posh. Now, the specs. 43 millimeters in stainless steel, but it's a cushion case. It's going to wear a little bit easier. And it's not terribly thick either. At 13.6 millimeters, this is solidly below the thickness of just about any Omega Dive watch that you can buy today. And it does bear a striking resemblance to the 1968 original. So you know this is a style that's already stood the test of time. It will continue to look really good. It comes with an extra NATO strap, which looks super sharp, color coordinated with the dial and the bezel. Plus, it comes with a strap tool, so they're gearing you up. It looks fantastic on a leather strap as well and they have a factory option so if you want to go with a true vintage look this is a great way to do it now I've cheated a little bit these cost between three thousand three hundred and twenty five dollars if you just get it on a strap or thirty six hundred if you do get it on a bracelet but and there's always a but these can be found under three thousand dollars pre-owned with full set and in bracelet spec so this definitely qualifies Plus, I know you guys can be shrewd businessmen, hard negotiators, and operators at the boutique level. So who knows, maybe you walk into a Torneau somewhere or a Longines boutique on the right weekend and you get this thing brand new for right around $3,000 with a little bit of back and forth. I know you guys have it in you. All right, Time Hill saying, now I want an Ultracron. That's what this episode's about. It's about appreciating these watches, not just that you have to settle for them, but that you might actively want them because they have a lot of virtues inherent. We have Netminder1 saying, Fears makes amazing and comfortable watches at that price point. That's true. Fears bringing back British watchmaking. Time Hill saying, Ultracron first rate. And Horology Homies saying, Mito fits. Hmm, Mito. We might hear more about Mito in this episode. That's a good guess. And then right here, we have Tobister McDonkey asking, Will 36mm make a comeback? 
Yes, yes it will, and in fact we've got a watch coming up that is available in 36 millimeter. We're not there yet, but we're going to talk about it in a moment. First, let's talk about going large. The Zinn U1B full tegament, we're also going to talk about the U50 titanium. So the U1B is the most wearable U1. Originally launched in 2005, the U1 has become semi-iconic for Zinn. It's the dive watch you think of when you think of Zinn dive watches. It's made of U-boat steel which is super hard and doesn't need to be rinsed after exposure to salt water. But here's the thing, this is U-boat steel with tegument. So think 350 to 400 Vickers and then a 1200 Vickers ceramic like carbon diffused coating on top of that. Super sharp, super resilient. I wore a tegament for four years, I never put a mark in it. I was able to take a key to the side of my Zin with tegament, scratch it as hard as I wanted, and it would leave key on the case, but it wouldn't leave a mark. With a pencil eraser, I could take the key metal off the side of the case. That's how durable this is. So if you want something that's accessible, but also durable, this isn't just about water resistance. I hate scratches, you hate scratches, and that's where tegament comes in. Now, it is big at 44 millimeters, but you're getting a lot. 1,000 meters water resistant, a bracelet with removable links fixed by hex screws so you, it's hard to over torque and round them off. There's a dive extension plus we have a captive bezel and the bezel like the case and the bracelet is tegament so super hard. The captive bezel means that you can't accidentally snap the bezel off from impact. Not a lot of companies use this but it makes it double tough. It's something you would expect from Zinn. Now, it does have an SW200, which is Salida's version of a 2A24, so it's mechanically unremarkable, but it is tough, very serviceable, and of course, Zinn adjusts these in-house, so it should keep good time. Now, $3,250. It's well under $3,000 if you get it on the strap. A little bit of negotiating with watch buys or a comparable vendor, you should be able to get this for around three grand. and pre-owned, you're going to get it for well under three grand. That's why it makes our list. Now, if you don't want to go 44 and full teg, in steel at least, well, you've got some options. You've got the U50 Titanium. Now, the U50 is a smaller Zin dive watch. 500 meters, quel dommage, we can deal with that. But you get a more wearable 41 millimeter case in titanium with full bracelet. You still have the captive bezel, so it's gonna stay put, and that bezel is tegament. So the part of the watch that's most likely to get hit has the hardening. Wonderful. Now, this is also a thinner watch at 12.3 millimeters, and that's partly because it uses a Salida SW300, which is Salida's version of the ETA 2892. So quite a bit thinner at 12.3 millimeters. This is competitive with Rolex thickness. That, that's Submariner thickness there. It also has the AR system to protect the interior of the watch. Now, contrary to the A and the R, this is actually nitrogen, not argon. Once upon a time, it was argon. Now it involves filling the case with nitrogen at the point of assembly to displace impurities, dust, and moisture. And there's a copper sulfate capsule that screws into the case. And if any moisture gets in, that little capsule will actively suck it out and dehumidify the interior of the watch. When it turns dark blue, time for a replacement. It's completely serviceable. This is an awesome watch. And again, a watch you're gonna be able to pick up for well under $3,000, even on the bracelet in this case. A timepiece that represents an awful lot of value and great durability from a company out of Frankfurt that is synonymous with tool grade German watches. See what's going on in the box now. You guys always have good comments and questions. Dan CT saying, when it comes to Zinn, I rather fancy the oil-filled UX in fully tegmented U-boat stall. That's true. The UX was the original oil-filled watch long before Resence. They did it for two reasons. One, it has the same index of refraction as the sapphire crystal on a dive watch. So from any angle, you can view the time. Second, with the watch now full of oil, it is incompressible, allowing for impossibly deep depth ratings. It is a very neat technology and one that once upon a time was equipped in Bell & Ross watches made by Zinn. Today you will only find it in Zinn watches. Definitely check out the UX. That's a cool watch and well-priced. It is quartz, but you know I like luxury quartz. We've got Ivan Jan joining in from Barcelona, joining this lovely stream a little late. That's okay, better late than never. I appreciate support in the show. We've got Brick Lane saying Tim's waiting to buy a Debatoon. That's why he doesn't buy these watches or any watches recently. That's true. 
That's my goal. That's the ultimate watch for me. But it's going to take one hell of an achievement or a milestone for me to actually make that leap. Having the money is one thing, but justifying it. For me, I need some sort of accomplishment. We've got Andy R joining from Strasbourg, France. And we've got Steve S saying, Zinu 50, easier wearing for sure. Love my Easy M3 for that reason. Easy M3 also a smaller Zin watch. Alan C saying, Zin is a cool brand, but they really, but I really want them to update their clasps. That's true. The, the stamped clasp thing in this day and age at any price, over two grand, it doesn't seem right. And then we have Eric N saying, no jewelry in clean rooms, on, off, on, off. Makes sense. I guess I missed something. There was probably a predecessor comment that I missed. Jean H saying, Zin 656, anyone? Yeah, smaller, more basic, elemental, very legible. I like the 656. Keystar G60 saying, when a watch moves you and makes you want it, a modest price tag shouldn't bother you. Sometimes a watch chooses you. And Brick Lane saying, encourage me a little bit. You'll get there, Tim. I appreciate the mini pep talk, Brick Lane. All right, we got Brian McCarthy joining in just now. Brian, you're just in time to talk about one of my personal favorites and an all-time great, a watch that has been to space, the Omega Speedmaster Professional X33, and it is a Speedmaster Professional. Made from 1998 to 2006, at least for public consumption. For a while after that, there was a military purchase. This one's 42.25 millimeters in titanium. It was marketed as designed by astronauts and cosmonauts and billed as the Mars watch when Mars seemed imminent in the 1990s. This was supposed to be the watch that would go there. Now the X-33 was certified and flown by NASA and others. It went up on the space shuttle, it went to Mir, it went to the International Space Station and more. This is a true flown watch that's got real space agency credibility behind it. It's got everything you could ever want and then some. A GMT, universal time, a universal time alarm, a mission elapsed timer up to 1,000 days, a mission elapsed time alarm, a chronograph, an 80 decibel alarm, a countdown timer, a perpetual calendar system, an 8 lux backlight, analog and digital time displays. It used a unique caliber 1666 that was created specifically for this model. And a lot of folks asked, why wasn't it thermocompensated right out of the gate? Well, because this watch was designed to be worn within a spacesuit and within a spacecraft, it was always supposed to exist in controlled climate. It was not designed for space walks. That's why it wasn't thermocompensated initially. The Delta version, or the fourth revision of the 1666, is actually thermocompensated. So if you're really interested in this and you're looking at a like a, a 3291 or a 3991, the second generation that was made from 2002 onward, if it has a delta movement, then it is thermocompensated, which would be the ultimate original X33. It is also significantly easier to use than the later Z33 and the X33 Skywalker models. So if you want to avail yourself of all the features, this one's a lot more intelligible. Uh, both the Mark I and Mark II are available full set on the bracelet for under three grand in great condition. And really, the bracelet is fantastic, but I recommend you get both it and the awesome factory Kevlar strap, because the Kevlar straps are colorful and look badass. You can get orange, you can get red, uh, you can even get black and olive green if you want a more mil-spec look. But I love the bright Kevlar. That's a cool looking watch, and it really makes it. For me, take the bracelet, put it in the box, get the value that comes with the bracelet, but wear it on the strap, because the strap is just so cool. It's a genuine historic collectible that represented the greatest space watch Omega and Swatch Group as a whole could make in the 90s. It is not compromised in any way. It is optimized, and it's still attainable. All right, Jim Millett saying, X33, they get so little attention on social media, but a very cool piece. And then Mark S. remembers, that was my biggest watch mistake, because I had a chance to get one for 700 bucks, new in box, through the military purchase program when I was in the Navy, and I'm like, oh, I don't know, I'll wait, I'll think about it. Even at current prices, that would have been a bargain. Pete's Timepiece Safari reminding us that for the same money, 
and 100 meters of water resistance, we could also get a Breitling Aerospace. That is the one shortcoming of the X-33. Rumor is it's way more than 50 meters water resistant, but for various reasons, including the hollow case back to make the alarm resonate more, uh, it, it's not going to be safe at that depth because the case back will permanently deform. That's what I've heard through the years. It's more water resistant than claimed, but from a practical standpoint, the limit is the case back, not the seals. All right, what else is going on? Biohazer saying, I have that exact Omega model and love it. It's my only quartz. All right, we got Mason one joining in from the UK saying Blanc Pen 5015 on the wrist tonight. That is a great watch. And then Time Hill saying did not know the X33 strap is Kevlar. Believe it. It's very cool. Those are decade straps. They last for a long time. Question from Ivan Yan asking what is on my wrist? Serial number 001 of the Garrick S6. Double guilloche dial with two tone red maroon and silver guilloche and sterling silver. This one's fully customized. Every option available on an S6 is on this watch. We got Joe Pinto joining in from Louisville and Mateo C likes that watch, he calls it super. Jim Millet compliments our friend wearing the Blanc Pen 50 Fathoms. He loves Mason One's watch, saying it is a fantastic watch. And I love it when you guys are mutually encouraging. We've got a great community here. Speaking of which, wrist shots number two. Derek W. of Ann Arbor, Michigan wears his Cartier Santos and watches the Miami Grand Prix. Looking good. And of course, the watch, not the car in focus. That's the correct order of precedence for watches tonight. Tac W. astounds with his GP Laureato at the excavation of terracotta warriors in Xi'an, China. Very cool. In this case, the background in focus is what matters because that is once in a lifetime stuff. Though I love your enamel dial, Laureato Eternity. Adrian T. of the Philippines shares an in-flight view of, well, watches tonight on the small screen and his steel ceramic Rolex Daytona. Martin T shares his watch box bought discontinued Rolex Milgauss white dial and fine fare. By the way, thank you for trusting our company and CQ who is your guy here at Watchbox. We have Mohammed E who collects his first IWC pilot's watch at the Dubai Mall Boutique. Wear it in good health. Let us know, how was the chocolate? Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on this list. Okay, Edward Ledden saying, I'm gonna check out Garrick after the show. Highly recommended. They've got a 32 week wait list, but one thing they'll do that no one else does is give you a portal login so you can actually watch the process of creating each part of your watch along the way. It's not just a sudden notice that there's a tracking number. They keep you apprised and it's super customizable. Movement finish, features, dial color, guilloche patterns, double up, different hands, different hand colors, different hand shapes. They guarantee accuracy, and surprisingly, this is a dress style watch, but it's 100 meters. Highly recommended. We have Ryan R, a good watch for $2,000. Any suggestions? I've got some, and they're coming. Okay, guys, jumping back in. Christopher H saying, really glad you're doing this show, Tim. There are a lot of good reasons to shop less expensive watches, but I've got a younger buddy into the watch hobby who will really appreciate a show like this, and we're gonna roll like thunder because we've got a lot to talk about tonight. So, Longine. We had a question earlier, are 36 millimeter watches making a comeback? Well, a little bit at Longines. You can get the next watch in 36 millimeters if you prefer. Of course, we're talking about the Longines Legend Diver, one of the first retro revival genre watches uh, in the dive segment. This one came out in 2007 and it's still going strong. Longines has always had a very strong heritage collection and that dates back to the original reissues of the Lindbergh back in the 1980s when no one was doing re-edition watches. They were very inventive in that regard. Now the watch is available in 42 or 36 millimeters so you do have some choices here but here I'm addressing the 42 specifically. Both are well under three grand so here $2,500 gets you that 42 millimeter watch, the chain mail bracelet, a 72 hour automatic movement with an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, you get an internal rotating dive bezel and no compromise for the vintage style, it's still a 300 meter depth rating, which is rare on these vintage style divers. 
highly evocative of the Irvin Picares super compressor cases that were equipped on Longines watches back in the 1960s. This is very true to form. Compare this to the similar JLC tribute to Polaris. Look at the pricing delta there and you recognize this value from Longines and it is quite a value. We also have the 36 millimeter case if you want plus colors that are very vibrant and attractive including blue and uh, one might say burgundy fume dials uh, to make it a little bit more contemporary so kind of a modern classic fusion right there and look at the attention to detail with the quadrille crowns for the winding setting and internal bezel really nice stuff right here we also have Jared Lacourt saying Tim looks better live. Thank you. I don't know. Maybe maybe I don't translate well on recorded streaming video. So if you're watching this streaming, not live, I apologize. I get ugly once the stream ends. What else is going on here? We've got Pete's Timepiece Safari recommending the Eterna Contiki Diver in bronze for under two grand on the gray market or pre-owned. Very cool. Steve B saying Doxa 300T Professional. Great value in heritage. 2,000 pounds in the UK. Doxa will be up soon. And then Theo S saying, if you want to go German, Glasuta SAR, Mula Glasuta SAR, Mission Timer, the Search and Rescue. Okay, speaking of Doxa, they're up now. We've got the Sub 200 Seagraph 2, reborn as a retro brand. Doxa of late has demonstrated more comfort offering modern designs with less historical rigor, and sometimes, as in this case, that's a really good thing. The 2023 Seagraph 2 offers offers an explosion of color across several different variants, so you're going to get something that suits your taste. You can go with conservative or very, very bright, and remember, at Doxa, very bright is historically correct, as we've had several different designs like, for example, Caribbean, Diving Star, Shark Hunter, so these colors are true to their history, even if the watch is very modern in design. Now, it's smaller and lighter than the 45 millimeter Seagraph 1 that came out three years ago. That was 45, this is a 42, it's a lot more wearable, it's a robust diving chronograph that packs value, and it's not just that it's 42 millimeters. There are other important measurements here. The big one for me is 46 millimeters lug to lug. That is what ensures this is going to fit a whole lot better, because you can have a 42 that's over 50 millimeters lug to lug and off limits for the likes of moi. This is game on if your wrist is bigger than 14 centimeters. Now, you get an SW510 movement, which is Salida's version of a 7750. It's automatic, it's very tough, and it packs a pleasing 56 hours of power reserve, which is still a bit more than average. Remember, the old 7750 is 42 to 48, so this is well above that. 200 meter water resistance, and it has a dive bezel. Couple of different versions of this watch. Uh, metallic bezel and ceramic bezel. So if you prefer one, double check the spec to make sure you're getting the spec you want with the watch. A dial and bezel detail are really quite excellent for an entry level dive chronograph and you are getting a lot here between the diving and the chronograph and the full bracelet. Now on the bracelet the watch ships with an accessory rubber strap that's color keyed to the dial so get it on the bracelet and they'll throw the strap in. Definitely get the vintage inspired beads of rice bracelet for value. It looks fantastic. Durability is going to be much higher than a strap. In the long run you won't have to buy replacement straps. Plus there is a fold out dive extension and on some versions of the watch it's only a $50 upcharge so why wouldn't you? Now, pricing here is actually a pretty narrow spread from the most basic version of the watch with a strap to the most deluxe version, some bezels cost more, with a bracelet. It's only $2,850 to $2,990. So this is uh, quite an affordable diving chronograph with a full bracelet. Get it on the full bracelet and never look back. This is a watch that retails full boat for under $3,000, and I know you guys will be able to negotiate at least 10 to 15%, making this a very agreeable combination. And if you don't like retro watches, this is also a good way to get into Doxa, an affordable, high-value diver, but it doesn't look like you're basking in reflected glory. Let's see what's going on in the box here. We've got Thomas Burnett saying a German chronograph at a great price. 1,950 pounds is the Hanhart 417 ES flyback, Panda or reverse Panda. Also, we've got Titus asking how many we, Titus Andronicus, I should say, 
How come we have so many dive watches today? Because there's a lot of dive watches in the sub $3,000 space. Also, it's the most popular genre. So I thought I would offer the most of that particular type of watch, given that that's the most commonly bought type of watch. But make no mistake, there will be others. Dress watches, GMTs, and more coming up. Then we have Alessio saying, or Alessio saying, sorry I'm late, Tim. The interview with Archie was great, by the way. Check out Archie. He had a great collector conversation here on Watchbox Studios. Open up a new tab, queue it up, get ready when I'm done streaming. Uh, great to see you here, Alessio. Happy that you've been able to join us. And Steve S., any interest in the Aquastar Deep Star? A little bit, but the watches here are here because they would be my preference. And then we've got Mr. YW, greetings Tim and Amit K. Tim, do you have any recommendations for an alternative to the Nomos Zurich? Actually, yes, I do have one coming up and it's from Mito. We're not there yet though. Okay, Mito, because we need a dress watch on the list. You asked and I've answered, see? I read your mind. I'm, I'm both psychic and clairvoyant. So, Mito is one of Swatch Group's most accessible luxury nameplates, and it's a proud old name dating back to 1918. It's also surprisingly one of Switzerland's top 10 certifiers of chronometers, up there with big boys like, for example, well, Tudor or Rolex. Impressive stuff, and it's shockingly upfront when you go to the Mito website about service prices. Look at this, three-hand automatic, 180 bucks. Chronograph multifunction, 175 bucks. Chronograph, 275 bucks. And you're good for five to 10 years after service, refreshing. Plus, they give you a two year service warranty after you pay your money. Very impressive, Mito. So the Multifort Powerwind is a handsome 40 millimeter steel day date dress watch for less than the cost of a service on a standard Royal Oak at Audemars Piguet. The watch is an automatic, a chronometer, and remarkably good looking for something so accessible. This is a sharp watch. You could guess that it might cost two or even three times as much as it does. This is a watch that could very easily slot into the collection of something like a La Suta Original or a Gégère Le Coult. It's that impressive. If this were called the Master Ultra Thin Day Date at JLC, from an arm's length, I would nod my head yes and say I'm impressed. So you're getting great value in the way it works and the way it looks, because it is, after all, a full bracelet complication chronometer with automatic winding that is lifetime serviceable and generational. You could hand this down to your kids. So. Mito also seems to grasp that modern buyers prefer that when two-tone gold effects are used on watches, they should be confined to the dial rather than slathered 80s or 90s style all over the bezel, the crown, and the bracelet. So they get this right. This is a great use of two-tone on a modern watch. Now there's an ETA 2836 in here, which is entirely appropriate because in chronometer spec, that's a watch that can win chronometry championships. And again, appropriate to the price, which at full list full bracelet right out of the Mito dealer is $1,940. So we had questions about sub $2,000 watches and also non-dive watches that fit our criteria. This is going to be both of those and an awesome value. A great watch to mark a minor occasion in your life or maybe the graduation of a student. This is a watch you can give without making a huge commitment either for their downstream service costs or your own financial outlay. Lots to love right here and Steve S saying I love beads of rice bracelets and we've got a couple of them tonight. We've got Miroslav saying Mito is the star of tonight's show so far. Well you better gear up because it's coming back. But first Speaking of quasi-obscure Swatch Group brands, Rado coined a classic in 2016 and it is one of my favorite watches of all time at any price. That photo doesn't flatter it, but we can go a little bit deeper. It is the Hyperchrome Ultralight. Ultralight. Let's go full screen here. We've got 43 millimeters in a case made of ceramic, aluminum, and titanium with a dial asymmetrically inspired by raked Japanese Zen rock gardens. It has a super fine concentric texture. It's also beautifully monotone. The whole thing has a mass of 56 grams. Remember Omega's $50,000 Seamaster Aquaterra Ultralight? That's 55 grams. 
Rado punching above its weight even against other Swatch Group stars. The 64-hour power reserve automatic caliber was likewise cut bridges and plates from aluminum to ensure that the ultralight theme was pervasive, comprehensive, and unique at this price point. Only 500 were made, and they were sold for $2,850. They're hard to find. Sometimes the thrill of the chase is less about mustering money and saving money and more about the detective work of finding an example to buy. This is often the case with vintage watches where few survive and perhaps even fewer survive in collectible condition. Well, this Rado is so rare, you will not find one right now on eBay or Chrono24. It's that scarce and I checked before the show. This is a thrilling watch to find and a satisfying watch to own because for less than its original retail price, you're getting into something the likes of which Omega charges 50 grand to own. It is very, very special. This is a watch whose exclusivity is driven by rarity, not price, and simply diving into the pursuit of this watch and following leads to the conclusion will make it more exciting to discover and more meaningful to own, because the second you put it on your wrist, you will already have a memorable story. Okay, viewer wrist shots number three. I asked, you answered. We're going big with Marceau R, who charms with his new white dial, Tudor Black Bay GMT, and Benoit the Rescue Dog. Good on you, Marceau. We have Koji A joins our action with his vintage Vacheron, super slick, absolutely timeless. It'll look as good 100 years hence. Mark K explores Del Mar, California with his Rolex Explorer 2, appropriately, polar dial. Vanessa C, she's a friend, she's a fan. Now she wears her new moon swatch, Mission to Jupiter, at Pizza Land in Disneyland, California. You'll remember the Pizza Land characters from the Toy Story series. Tarek H cruises with his Rolex Sky Dweller in the BMW 3 Series. I love my watches and wheels. I'm actually browsing Bring a Trailer as I cast this episode. And we've got Abdul R who reports from Germany with his Nomos Club Campus Amsterdam edition. Looking good. By the way, Abdul, a PhD in engineering who teaches at that university. Super impressive. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch in this box. We've got a lot of friends tonight. This show so far is doing fairly well. Let's see if we can get this up to 300 concurrent viewers. We have all sorts of friends in the box and we have someone calling me the walking encyclopedia. I would be happy just to be the walking Wikipedia. This is, after all, the internet. Okay, best $3,000 watches. Mido comes roaring back. We had a question about an alternative to the Nomos Zurich Weltzeit, and here it is right now. Because we have an affordable GMT, and we needed an affordable travel time watch on this list tonight. This watch is a travel timer and a GMT. There was the 1961 limited edition of the decompression scale that came out in 2021. This is not that limited edition. This ups the ante. The watch here is a 2023 regular offering that adds features without bulk, because the whole thing with all these features, the decompression scale, the automatic winding, the 80 hour power reserve, the world time, the second time zone, 40.5 millimeters in stainless steel with a true second time zone in a 24 hour format, independently settable, and a calculator bezel featuring prominent cities that allows you to read world time in a pinch. And it features correct decompression scale for serious divers, always nice to have. And it's accomplished with color and charm with two different dial and bezel versions, one black, one blue tinted. This is the blue. Mido packs in the features. In addition to all of the above, yes, it has more than three days of power reserve, 80 hours with an automatic movement, and an anti-magnetic titanium-based hairspring on a free-sprung balance, very upscale. You've got that 200 meter water resistance and here is the accessory strap that comes with the mesh bracelet. So you get the mesh bracelet plus According to that shockingly cheap service schedule, full boat maintenance on this thing will be only 175 bucks, roughly once every decade. Very cool, Mito. Very, very, very cool. And you're wondering, what does all this cost? Just over $1,300 is what this costs. Just over $1,300.
That's assuming you have no negotiating skills and you pay full list. Imagine getting it pre-owned. That, my friends, is value. Now, a big piece from Germany. We showed Zinn. We talked about Mulla Glasuta. We don't have any room in our budget for Langa. We don't have budget for Glasuta Original, Lang und Heine, or Moritz Grossman, but we've got plenty of space for Damasco, so open wide. It's the DC-80. If you like the Zinn Easy M1 or 1.1, you're gonna love this German-made chronograph. And yes, it's a chronograph. It's more wearable than the 43 millimeter Easy M1.1, 42 millimeters rather than Zinn's 43. Plus, this is only 13.7 millimeters thick. It is much thinner than the Zinn. Damasco uses a proprietary ice-hardened steel that creates a straight-through-the-case hardness of 800 Vickers. It actually used to be used on Zins before Damasco withdrew the right to use that technology on Zins. So Zin created Tegment, but the Damasco ice-hardening creating that 800 Vickers surface, which is more than twice as much as U-boat steel. Think about this. Unlike Tegment, which creates a hard but only microns thick surface, ice hardening, a Damasco, hardens the watch all the way through to its core, which is why Zin Tegament will dent if it's impacted by something sharp, but the same blow may not even leave a mark on a Damasco, because underneath the surface hardness, there's just more of the same 800 Vickers hardness. So it's tougher to dent than a Zin, which is important to durability. And they don't skimp. They use the same treatment on the crown, the pushers, the case back, and the bezel. And on top of the bezel, what you see is actually a super hard black DLC-like coating on top of the ice-hardened bezel surface. Super resilient. There's a lot going on tech-wise. The watch also boasts one 1,000 Gauss or 80,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetism, something the EZM 1.1 does not have. We have 100 meter water resistance and a bezel that is super slick, ratcheting on three ceramic poles for a super refined, ultra high-end German equipment experience. If you want to feel like a German engineer sweated the details on your watch, this is the way to do it. And you can see it is a timing bezel. You can also get it if you want on a 12-hour scale, if you want to time larger intervals or use it as a sort of travel time guide for calling far-flung business associates. Lots more going on. You've got a crosshair no-date dial that's emotionally satisfying for tool watch purists. Plus, there's also a DC82 with a date for basically the same money if you must have a date. And there are several different colors if you don't like bright green. You got orange, you got black and white, you've got the green. In other words, you have choices. Now, as with Zinn, Damasco has used a modified Valju 7750 architecture to work with center minutes like the old Le Mania 5100, which was their mechanical model. Now, it's also a 50-hour movement, which means you get a bit more than a 7750. Damasco's done a lot of in-house modifications here. And it is also five-position adjusted in-house, which is the same standard you'll find on auto horlogerie and chronometers. So very impressive. Packed with features, the DC-80 would cost a fortune if some Richemont brand like Panerai or IWC were selling it exactly like it's made today. It costs $2,560 to buy this brand new, and Damasco even offers a bomb-proof factory bracelet accessory that costs only $720 that is fully ice-hardened, uses hex screws for removable links, every link is removable, and all of the hardware for the pivots is titanium grade five. This is German over-engineering at its best for $720. Bucks. Added to the cost of the watch, you'll be all up $3,280, assuming they don't give you a credit for the strap. A little bit of negotiation, and I think even considering our budget, you're gonna get in at or just under $3,000 buying this thing with the bracelet. And if you blow past the budget, 280 bucks, it'll still be money well spent. Okay, viewer wrist shots. Adam H watches us from his son's orchestra practice. Sorry to distract with the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter chronograph. Travis E. reports from Petra in Jordan, remember Indiana Jones 3 right there, with his Breitling Super Ocean. Travis also doubles up with two wrist shots, including the beast 
That is the Cadillac Super Limo used by the President of the United States, and he even captured two Secret Service wrist shots in that shot with the beast. Dan the Watchman owns the enviable El Primero-powered Abel 1911 chronograph, as made famous on Miami Vice. Brian R. of Texas is a colorful character in his production studio with the Grand Seiko SBGE 211 GMT. And Perry P. takes us home with his Mazda Miata on the road with the Casio Edifice EFR S108D. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Join me now on Instagram and check out Archie's collector conversation after the stream. Thanks to you. Thanks to Sean. Time out, Tim out. Until next week, thanks for logging on.